Southern Exposure, and of course I am standing at one of the well-known historic landmarks right here in Georgia's Rome. And I have also a wonderful friend on today with me that is a very much um, probably another historic yeah, landmark. Another historic <laughs> landmark. <laughs> and when you see, when you hear and see her, you'll know exactly it's Ann Culpepper, of course. And we are here in front of the the clock because we wanted to share with you um, a little bit of information about the history and of course the the all through the time and as well as where we are going in the future for the clock so Anne, thank you so much for coming out today on this, this beautiful is, day this is one of my favorite places i know next to myrtle hill, next to myrtle hill. and that's of course there's a, a bench actually yeah. commemorating uh, yeah. your love of this this particular hill yeah. so let's talk a little bit take us back in time uh, and tell us a little bit about the clock's history the clock was envisioned by uh, Mr. Noble, who owned the foundry in Rome. And Mr. Noble felt like that all of the ills that had fallen on Rome during the Wawa <laughs> were because of his foundry. So what he wanted to do was to build a water storage facility. Up until that point, we're talking like 1867. Um, up until that point, people got their water from wells. And so he took a group of people from Rome up to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where they had a huge steel water tank on a hill. And Bowling Green is very much like Rome in the hills. And they looked at it, and so they passed like a bond issue and built the steel tower inside that holds the water and it held 250,000 gallons mm. of water. That was done in 1871. Then in 1872 they built the brick superstructure around the water tank and put the clock up on top. And it has become a symbol of the city of Rome. In fact, I guess it still is, but for years and years it was the watermark and all the city stationery. It is on all everything, and uh, it is just a part of Rome, and it can be seen from all over. It's so funny when you, there's the most beautiful view of it when you're coming in uh, Ridge Ferry Parkway, and you look up and suddenly see the club. But it's just a part of Rome and always has been. And of course, the clock actually features four faces. Four faces. And still chimes to this day on the hour yeah. and on the half hour. Yeah. Right? So, you know, let's go now to a little bit more modern day history. In the 80s, the JCs, the Rome JCs, yeah, came in and did a, a facelift. And then in 1993, um, we, and this is the city of Rome, not me personally, cut a door into the steel uh, tank. And at that point, an artist here known named Chuck Smut came in and painted a mural around the walls. And the clock became open to the public in the sense on special occasions. The clock, like lighthouses was not built for people to tromp up and down the steps all day and it's so funny i've noticed in all the thousands of students i've taken up here they feel like the harder they can step on the steps <laughs> the less likely they are to not make it to the top or down so that takes a wire and um the last facelift was several years ago and we're getting to the point where paint repair work mm -hmm. and the citizens of Rome love this clock and we want them to be a part of this restoration. Well, and we are we are going to talk about that. Well, yeah. What I'd like to do now is go on in, since you did mention that famous artist that's our yeah. local, local uh, yeah. hero here, Chuck Schmoltz. Uh, I'd like to go in and look a little bit at the artwork, talk okay. a little bit about how it depicts our history, and the fact, too, that the Romary History Museum actually keeps the clock open on the first Saturday uh, yeah. of the of each month, and you can come and tour it, and that's kind of a really nice thing. They're yeah. also doing a restoration on 
the display cases. Yes. And so thank you to the Rome Area History and Museum. And one other tiny thing. Uh, in 1883, Rome's first public school was built, and if we, it was the building was still here, we'd be somewhere in the building. Mm -hmm. But it came to within a, a side, narrow sidewalks width of the clock. And when the men came up to pull the weights to the clock to run eight more days, if the students were out playing, they got to go up. Now wow. I have to send home all of these permission slips. Exactly. And also the clock is operated by a computer. And it's so strange to realize you always know when uh, the power has been off because each face is a different time. <laughs> <laughs> she's keeping time, we're just not sure what, where, where she's keeping time, right? Yeah. So let's go on inside and okay. look at the murals. around this hand and, and tell us a little bit about Chuck Schmolt who is an artist here in town uh, a very well-known artist who's done a lot of work here but he was commissioned to, to depict the history of Rome yeah and he did a marvelous job yes. and I, <clears throat> these walls uh, were brought up from the noble foundry on the back of a wagon pulled by mules and they were riveted into place and Chuck loved the fact that the rivets were here. And in his mural, he put a band, a board on each lower and uh, up, that makes it look like a thick roll of film. And I think that was a wonderful touch. He started off with the Native Americans, the Cherokees, and the Native Americans used weirs to trap their fish for food. And sometimes they built the weirs doing rock formations out into the river. And oftentimes they would use a natural weir. And the weir he used for a model for this part of the bureau is over behind uh, where the Goodwill story is now. I used to say Kroger, but Kroger's been gone a long time, so behind the Goodwill story, the Edouard River. Uh, then the next segment is uh, the founding of Rome, and it shows uh, two of the founders meeting at the spring in downtown Rome, which was really larger than people thought, but is several blocks from here. And then the next one is a riverboat on the Pisa River, and the boat in it actually existed, and it was the Alvaretta. Now, people who come in from the Atlanta area think we've misspelled Alpharetta, but that's the way the boat was spelled, and it was called the Alpharetta. And then the next uh, segment is uh, John Wisdom, and he rode into Rome to warn the uh, Romans, and his mother lived here. I think that's really why he came. But he came in to warn the citizens of Rome that the Yankees were on the way, and that first time Rome was able to withstand the attack. And then the next uh, segment is the clock tower when it was built, and the people in the two people in the mural are dressed as people would have been dressed in that period. The next uh, part of the mural is the cotton block and it was when cotton was king and uh, the cotton farmers brought their bales of cotton in and piled them up in the middle of Broad Street for the cotton buyers to grade and look at. And then the next segment is uh, Bandy Jones and Bandy Jones owned a service station and a service station for those of you who remember is where you could go and they would fill up your tank, check your oil, wash your windshield and check the tires. Sadly, Benny Jones is out of business, <laughs> but he was a very important part of the history of Rome. And then the next segment is uh, Harbin Hospital, the old, the original 
Uh, the original hospital was down in Broad Street, but the first one that was built on 3rd Avenue. And then we come around to City Hall and the Wolf out in front. And then our magnificent, magnificent Sploss built library, which looks from the river like a boat. And those are the 10 murals that go around the wall. And of course, the original works are still also in here. Yeah. The original works from the E. Howard Clock Company. And they were put up on top in October of 1872. And when the clock, men would go up and pull the weights every eight days. And when the clock would strike, this wheel would turn. And when we brought it down, they had it synchronized so that it would work. But this building, as you can imagine, this steel on this hill, this bill is, hill is, uh, building is very often takes a lightning strike. So it doesn't work anymore. Maybe it will after like the rest of us. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go up and get the breathtaking views and vistas of Rome from the top of the clock yeah. and talk a little bit about um, the next plan for the restoration. Okay. You get upstairs, you will be directly over where you're standing now. said after 107 steps here we are on top and we're actually really not on the top but this is the top for the public and above us still is the clock face we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the dimensions to really put it in perspective because you don't get that dimension from the ground level but of course this is one of the places that's the most absolutely incredible beautiful views of the city of Rome is from right here and actually also the county because behind us you have all of the Appalachian um, Lavender Mountain Chain and Colonel Hill, Mount Alpha, uh -huh. Jackson Hill. You can see all of the all of the hills. Just absolutely breathtaking. And of course, we also want to point out that the Ramary History Museum does come up and change out the photos. And Dennis Nordeman is one of their volunteers that actually tags these photos and kind of explains to you what you are looking at at these different point vantage points uh, from the clock tower, the top of the clock. Now we are on the top of the clock, roughly 107 steps up. What level height-wise are we here? I think the whole thing is like a hundred and let me see if my cheat sheet tells me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I really actually know that. We if we're a hundred and four over the clock is 104 feet above the ground. Wow. And then this hill is roughly 610 feet above sea level. So this is really the highest point in there. Oh, that's awesome. Now, put us, kind of put us in perspective here as we look up. And of course, the, the film is going to really kind of tell the true story about why it's time, a very timely point in time, to bring in some professional folks who understand historic restoration, to scrape, to, yeah. and to, to redo the paint and of course fix the rotted wood because this is like you said our signature it is, and it has we cannot lose this that's right so tell us about the size of the faces and um well as i said earlier the clock was made by the uh e howard clock company mm -hmm. and the bell was put in in uh, october of 1872 and is still in use and incidentally the bell in the clock tower at the bell tower at st peter's was made by the same company oh wow um but and was came at a later date the face is nine feet in that di diameter 
the minute hand is four feet and three inches and the hour hand three feet and six inches and when we hang the wreaths up here at Christmas they're large wreaths and when you drive along and look up they look like Barbie house wreaths <laughs> and people are always asking me why don't you get bigger wreaths and I say we have but it just <laughs> but I tell you it is so beautiful and we're gonna actually share with all of you some of the vistas um, as as uh, Chuck walks around and films the, how gorgeous it is we're gonna take away for just a second and get that on film and then we're gonna be talking to Joe Smith who is the city clerk of Rome and also over the facilities of Rome. He's gonna talk a little bit about the restoration project and how you can get involved. We're back with Joe Smith, who is the city clerk here in Georgia's Rome. And of course, Joe, we were talking a little bit, we've been with Ann today about the history of Rome, the beautiful art that's downstairs, the efforts that the Rome Area History Museum has made, and of course, what the JCs did, what the city's done, and now the modern day. Here we are in 2015, and we realize that there's some restoration work that needs to be done. Like most structures, it's an ongoing effort to keep them maintained, especially something as historic as the clock sitting on top of our tower. Uh, you probably know the tower is in fairly good shape, but the clock and all the wood area at this site needs some attention, from the doors to the louvers to the clock itself. Of course, here we are on top of the clock tower, and we're about to enter the clock itself. And although the citizens often come up to the top of the clock for tours and various things, not many people actually go inside the clock. But we'll go inside, see some of the inner workings of the clock, how it's uh, constructed, and the actual clock operation itself. Well, here you'll see the inside of the clock, uh, a wood structure. Even though the clock has been here many, many years, the stair system is relatively new. At one time, there were a series of ladders to work your way up through the clock to get to the actual clock work its works themselves. Now there's some stairs, a little more accessible than it was at one point. Right now we're standing inside the part of the portion of the clock where the faces of the clock are housed. This is a face, this is a face, a face, and then finally a face. Of course, there's one on each of the four sides. Now, as you can see, this is what actually turns the hands today, an electric clock, basically. One for each of the four faces, and they're controlled by one unit. Our city electrical department takes care of making sure that the clock is operating properly, adjusts the time as needed, repairs issues, such as when the power goes out, they'll be able to reset it, synchronize the faces, and keep it working properly. Interestingly, each of the clock faces has a little trap door that can be opened. There's pictures that have been taken through the years of the door open with people's heads stuck through the hole. I think they were there at one time so the hands could be moved manually. Here we move to the very top of the clock, right underneath the bell. Of course, here's the actual bell itself that rings every hour. mechanisms in place for striking the bell. The old one here on, on this side, which I don't believe is in operation anymore, but never actually been up here when the bell rang. But I think this is on this side is the is the newer hammer that hits the bell. So here we're up several several 
feet higher than the actual tower itself. We're up, what would you say, another 20 feet at least. Located. This is an open area, of course, exposed to all the elements year round. And while it's basically structurally sound, there are some issues that need attention. There's some, some, some trim that, uh, that has seen its better day. Uh, this ladder, for example, it leads up to the widow's walk. Uh, it, it needs rebuilding. You can see everything needs scraping and repainting. But there's some areas, uh, here's an area that looks suspect at the, the bottom here. It looks like there could be some areas some attention needed beyond paint there. How long has it been since there was a restoration? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. When, when there was any work done on the clock itself beyond, beyond painting, uh, it could be 20 plus years ago. Not, not certain of that. So there's several, several layers of paint accumulated. This piece, for example, the wood seems fine underneath it, but it could use a refreshing and fresh paint. It's, of course, accumulated quite thick over the years with all the coats. That is, um, it's really cool to be up here. Yeah, yeah, not, not a whole <laughs> lot of people get to see this part of it. house painting job because no. it is historic. Right, a little more involved at this point than painting. Uh, it's been painted several times through the years. But uh, let me take a step beyond that at this point. There's some actual wood that needs replacing and restoring. Then once this area is prepped, more painting. Now, of course, this is a joint project that the city of Rome citizens and Floyd County and or anybody who's ever had any dealings with Rome, Georgia and loves this clock can get involved with the city in this restoration effort. That's true. Uh, it'll be a, a multi-phased effort from the government to the citizens. Anyone who's interested in Rome's most famous landmark can make a donation to help restore it and keep it in the shape that it, it belongs to be in. And of course the Rome Area Heritage Foundation has already stepped up and they're going to actually be the fiscal agent. We're going to post their address where you can send donations uh, to that particular not-for-profit. So it's, it's kind of wonderful. You're giving to this community, but you're also getting something back because it is a not-for-profit 501c3. And then we're talking about different ways that we can thank people, thank the citizens for matching these funds with the, the city. And our goal is $40,000 overall with the city's contribution as well as private citizens and possibly doing some engraved bricks. That is. That's a real possibility, something to consider. A way for those people who have made donations to have a brick with their name on it to be memorialized from this point forward here on site. I think that's a great, great opportunity for everyone to get involved. You know, we're going to just kind of leave it where school kids can get involved, your church groups, your civic organizations, everybody who loves the clock, and that's anybody who's ever been here, can give, uh, give back to our community through the Rome Area Heritage Foundation. It's a great project. Well, thank you so much, and we look forward to, as this project starts to move forward, 
um, to see what happens in the future with it. Right. Well, thank you for getting started. All right. Thanks so much to my two guests today. Joe Smith's been on here with us uh, representing the city of Rome. And we want to also let you know that the actual grounds of the clock tower are available as well for facility rental. So if you have um, something you would like to have a special evening or a special afternoon, right. you can get in touch with Joe at the uh, city clerk's office, which is the city auditorium. My other special guest was Ann Culpepper, and she is, of course, the woman with all the knowledge about the history of Rome, and we are at one of her favorite places as well as looking out onto her other favorite place, which is Myrtle Hill Cemetery. I'm Lisa Smith, and I want to just say a personal thank you to Chuck Meeks, who is filming the show. We've been off for a long time, and of course he has stepped up and donated his time uh, back to the Library Channel where he got his career start. So thanks so much, Chuck, for being a part of this show, coming back out, and especially for this idea about how we could restore the clock, which is also near and dear to your heart. I'm Lisa Smith here on Southern Exposure on Channel 4, the Library Channel. Thanks for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you and also getting you involved in the restoration project of the clock tower.